Hello. The episode you're about to listen to is part of a multi-part series introducing an overview of Japanese history. This is a repeat of one of the original projects the History of Japan podcast was built on, and is intended to serve as an update and supplement to these original works. After 10 years, my hope is to return to this approach and to do it a little bit better given the skills that I have improved in the intervening years. If you haven't been doing so already, you should listen to these episodes sequentially, starting with episode 501. Without any further ado, enjoy the episode. Hello and welcome to the History of Japan podcast, episode 525, A Day in the Life of Tokugawa Japan. Today I want to take a break from our regularly scheduled Onward March of History to talk about something a bit different. One of the fun things about history, at least in my view, is seeing a bit of yourself in the past, seeing parts of your life reflected in the lives of those who came before. And so I want to take an episode to talk a bit about something we all experience, daily life. What was daily life in Tokugawa, Japan like? Well, a couple of quick notes before we get into this. First, this is going to focus more, though not entirely, on city life over country life, which is not representative of the population of Japan at this time. Most people in Japan during the Tokugawa years were still living in the countryside, and while the urban population did grow, that growth was more like from a single digit to a low double digit percentage than a flipping completely of the urban rural dynamic. That sort of population shift is more of a 20th century type of thing. Now, it's not representative of how most people live day to day, but urban life is just better documented than rural life during this period, so it's what I'm going to focus on. Second, even just focusing on urban life, or focusing primarily on urban life, there's no way I can be entirely representative of what that looked like just because of the range of diversity within urban life during this period. Japan in the 16 and 1700s was not like, say, the United Kingdom, where pretty much every aspect of life was dominated by London. The so-called three capitals of Kyoto, the cultural mecca, Osaka, the economic heart, and Edo, the political center, were all distinct, not to mention the various castle towns. With that much variety, specificity would be a logistical challenge, to say the least, so I'm gonna speak a bit generally here simply because there's no way not to. So, with all that said, imagine that you are living in the big city during the Edo period. What's your life like? Well, for a start, you probably belong to one of a few distinct social groups, which were in turn organized more or less into a four-part social structure inherited from Chinese Confucianism. First, of course, were the samurai themselves, whose quality of life varied quite a bit based on their inherited station. Members of the lower levels of the samurai class lived on meager stipends of a few koku of rice a year, while more elite samurai could have hundreds or even thousands to their names, not to mention actual jobs in government with stipends all their own. Then there were the artists and the merchants, collectively lumped together under the designation of cholnin, or townsmen. These groups, especially the merchants, tended to be rather well off during the period of peace, since peace, after all, means stability, economic growth, and trade. Indeed, some of the wealthiest people of this period, at least from what we can tell, because wealth is a little challenging to measure, were the major merchants of Osaka, particularly the rice exchange merchants whose shipping networks connected the commercial and agrarian economy of the whole country. Then there's what we might call the lower class of urban life. Some of these people were from professions that didn't fit very cleanly into the four-class hierarchy of Confucianism, such as sex workers, because prostitution was legal and regulated by the state during this period, or artists, actors, poets, those sort of people. Others were what we might call itinerant laborers, particularly from the countryside. Officially, state policy during this period bound members of the peasantry to their place of residence. After all, they were the tax base, so you can't have your farmers just wander off to the city because they feel like it. 
Practically, though, those kind of policies were always hard to enforce. Rural people looking for work that paid better than farming would make their way in large numbers to the cities, where urban dwellers who needed labor, porters, construction workers, maids if you're wealthy, whatever, well, they tended not to ask too many questions about where their new hires came from. Generally, people who took this route would return home after a couple of years with their wages, though others would spend their whole lives in the city. Your social class would, of course, determine a lot about how your day got started. The more things change, the more they stay the same, I suppose. From what time you got up, before sunrise if you're doing a labor or service gig, substantially after if you were wealthy enough, to what you ate for breakfast. And by the way, the Edo period is one of the first parts of Japanese history where we have a decent idea of what people actually ate day to day. Members of the samurai class, for example, were often enjoined to frugality in their consumption to the point of rarely, if ever, consuming white rice. Barley, quite a bit cheaper, was often the staple grain or was mixed with rice to stretch it out. That sort of frugal eating was enjoined at the highest level. Both Tokugawa Ieyasu and his son and heir, the second shogun, Hidetada, were famous for consuming a mix of barley and rice to model frugality for their followers and their subjects. Accompanying such simple fare for those enjoined to frugality or left no choice by their financial circumstances would be simple stuff like pickles or rice porridge or miso soup. For the wealthy, meanwhile, you might see things like fried or braised fish or tofu or kinchi tamago, which is a type of shredded egg crepe. As an aside, the question of food culture during this period is a really fascinating one in its own right. As a general rule, as the Edo period went on and the standard of living continued to improve, access to a wider variety of quality foodstuffs became more normal. Traditional elite cuisine became more accessible, as more and more people had the time and money to get licensed as professional chefs, driving the price of professionally prepared food substantially downward. For example, the Shijo aristocratic house of Kyoto was famous for its expertise in classical cooking, much as other aristocratic families were famous for their teachings on poetry or history or whatever. And over the course of the Edo period, members of the Shijo house began to take trainees in their official style and license them. This sort of approach to training was common in everything from cooking to the martial arts. Simply put, if you wanted to master a skill, you would sign up with a family school which had an Iemoto, a grandmaster of the style, a position usually passed down within the family, and when there was no suitable family member, a promising student was usually adopted to take on the role. After many years of study, first under the Iemoto students, and then maybe the Iemoto himself, you would be licensed to call yourself a master of whatever style, and you could both advertise that and take students of your own. And you could follow this method and become a Shijo house licensed cook, or if that was too much work, you could buy a recipe book like the Shijo Ke Hocho Shoroku, or written records of the cuisine of the Shijo house, which purported to tell you all the secrets of Shijo style cooking, and which you could find at most major cities, perhaps to the chagrin of the Shijo house, at a bookshop. If you wanted something a bit more exotic than traditional Japanese fare, Examples included goren, or goreng, a type of Javanese-inspired dish made with fried fish, or furugasteru, frikadel, which appears to have been a Dutch-inspired cuisine made with finely minced beef and cabbage, which was mixed with eggs, seasoned with cooking wine, covered in breadcrumbs, and then fried. Speaking of frying, Portuguese missionaries appear to have been the ones who introduced battered frying as a technique, the basis of a very popular food, at least among those who could afford it during the Edo period, tempura. For most, of course, food was a lot simpler. In the city's noodle stalls, akin to the ones you see around today, were a common place for workers to grab a quick bite during their downtime, with soba being the preferred noodle of the Kanto area, and udon more common in the Kansai. Farmers, meanwhile, ate even more simply from what we can tell, unless you were part of the rare rural wealthy elite. Bakfu ordinances regarding the diet of farmers compared them to falcons. Starving them, of course, wasn't good, but if you indulge them too liberally, they become fat and weak. They were also compared sometimes to sesame seeds. The more you squeeze the seeds, the more oil you get from them. A series of ordinances from early in the history of the Bakfu 
banned rural consumption of everything from tofu to soba noodles to sake. Instead, peasants were to live simply on wheat and other grains, supplemented by radishes and potatoes. How effective those ordinances were remains a matter of substantial scholarly dispute. There are definitely some grim reports of conditions in the countryside. The late 17th century scholar Kumazawa Banzan described conditions in the countryside around the Kansai area as follows, quote, Peasants toil and suffer all year long. Everything they produce is taken away as annual tribute. Those who cannot provide enough are forced to sell their wives, daughters, forest land, or livestock. Peasants thus leave home, becoming vagrants and beggars. Those who remain in the village die of starvation in years of bad harvest. And Kumazawa wasn't the only one to frame things in such a stark light. Tanaka Kyugu, who rose from humble peasant origins to headship of a village and from there to laboring as an official under the reformist shogun Tokugawa Yoshimune, had this to say about the lives of peasants in his native Musashino in 1721. Quote, peasants who reside in the areas with rice paddies may sometimes eat rice, but only in combination with other edibles. Many of those who live in the mountains or areas with dry fields cannot even eat rice for the three festival days of the new year. Even when cooking millet, deccan grass, or wheat, they mix in so many greens, turnips, potatoes, bean leaves, or other leaves that one can hardly see the grain. Moreover, they eat such food only once a day, not twice, and supplement their meal with watery gruel. They do not even sit for their meal. Despite this horrible diet, they must work in the fields from four in the morning until midnight, after which they twine rope or make shoes and straw sandals. It is worth noting both Kumazawa and Tanaka did have an incentive to portray things very negatively. Kumazawa was a reformist who wanted to see the shogunate substantially reformed to be more merit-based in its policies, and thus had a reason to hunt for its failings. Tanaka was a Confucian advocating for reform in how the countryside was managed, which meant establishing that current policies weren't working. That said, that's a reason to be suspicious of a source and corroborate it, not to discard it altogether. Anyway, after breakfast, of course, you'd be up and at it, though what exactly you'd be up and at would vary quite a bit. A member of the samurai class would have one of two options before them. Some would have inherited positions from their parents or in exceptional circumstances gotten a job based on merit of all things. However, there were always more samurai than jobs in the administration, and so most domains had at least some unemployed samurai. The number so unemployed varied from time to place, one study of the Hatamoto, or direct retainers of the Shogun, found that about 20-25% to 25 at any given time didn't have a job, and we generally assume that's reasonably representative. Of course, inherited family prestige being what it is, most of those unemployed samurai were from the lower ranks of the class, a pattern which held in the domains as well, where lower-ranking samurai were far more likely to be unemployed than higher-ranking ones. So if you were employed, you were functionally a bureaucrat in the state bureaucracy, in charge of tax collection or managing repairs to the domain castles, or keeping the domain supply of horses cared for, or whatever else needed doing. If you were not employed, then your options were a bit more open. One of our best sources for the life of an unemployed samurai is the autobiography of Katsukokichi, a low-ranking Hatamoto who was born in 1802 in Edo. Kokichi was adopted into the Katsu family from another samurai family, the Otani, as the Katsu were without a male heir of their own. Despite coming from a well-regarded family, his biological father and biological older brother were well-regarded calligraphers and scholars, Kokichi didn't really live up to the hopes of the Katsu family for their adopted heir. He was, by his own description, an idler and a gambler, who only occasionally made use of the Bakufu office designed to help unemployed samurai like him find work, and who instead supplemented his meager 41 koku income by gambling, working in pawn shops, and even working as a hired thug, among various other unsavory employments. Today, Katsukokichi is probably best known because his son would become a major player in the events that led to the fall of the shogunate, but his story is really pretty interesting in its own right, too, and his autobiography is available in English under the title Misui's Story, 
If you're at all interested in the more unsavory side of samurai life during this period, Musui's story is definitely worth a read, and we did a whole episode on it once upon a time, episode 323. As for non-samurai, artisans and merchants would generally inherit a family business, or if they were second and third sons, might be adopted out to other families who needed an heir for their family business. As an aside, many of Japan's best-known firms today had their origins in that sort of family business. For example, Mitsui, which is today one of the largest corporations in the world, got its start as a family business founded by Mitsui Takatoshi, a merchant from what's now Mie Prefecture, who ran a pawn shop and a miso-selling business. Gekkeikan, probably the best-known brand of sake in the world today, began as a family business established by Ogura Jiemon in 1637. The name was changed to Gekkeikan after the fall of feudalism. All told, over 3,000 businesses with histories stretching back to before the end of feudalism in Japan still exist today, with the largest concentration being in Kyoto, just over 300, and Edo, modern Tokyo, just under 300. As for farmers, well, your day depended a lot on the position you were in. For most, doubtless, subsistence farming took up most of the day. Wealthier farmers, though, who owned more land than they could productively farm and thus could generate extra income by renting it out, or who had managed to build up a solid surplus of wealth in other ways, they had other opportunities. If you could afford the startup costs, side employments were a common way for farmers to make extra income. This included things like sake brewing, because before modern refrigeration and sterilization, Sake had to be made locally and couldn't be shipped long distances, or silk weaving or various other crafts. All of these were great for supplementing a farming income, and because they didn't really fit into the taxation system built on farming fields, that income was largely untaxed. And as a result, over the course of the Edo period, a class of wealthy peasants, gono is the Japanese term, would emerge in the countryside thanks to their access to this type of employment or to the aforementioned scheme of just renting out their extra land. These Gono families tended to be more educated than their rural peers, since they could afford not to have their kids working from a young age, and of course materially better off. Thus they were more politically engaged, and tended to dominate rural politics and society, in some cases well into the 20th century. Of course, there are two groups whose lives I haven't really talked about up until this point, women, and children. And there are reasons for this grounded in our available sources. Indeed, when it comes to the stories of women in particular, one of the most famous academic works on the subject, Marsha Yonemoto's The Problem of Women in Early Modern Japan, is called that because the problem is that their lives are very poorly documented in their own terms, and what little we know about women from this period tends to be filtered through the words of men. Public discourse about the role of women was certainly plentiful, but also heavily inflected by the social and political norms of the time, particularly by Neo-Confucianism, a form of revised Confucian orthodoxy that originated in Imperial China about a thousand years ago, and which had developed a following in the halls of power in Edo, though it was never as influential in Japan as it would be in Korea and China. The most famous example of this is the so-called Onna Daigaku, or Greater Learning for Women, authored by the Neo-Confucian scholar Kaibara Ekken in the early 1700s. The text enjoins women to absolute obedience to men, and in particular popularized a notion borrowed from continental Confucianism of the so-called Three Obediences, that women should be obedient to their fathers, then their husbands, and then to their eldest sons if the husband died. The Onla Daigaku is not the only text of its type, either. Consider the anonymously published Honcho Onna Nijushiko, or 24 Paragons of Women's Filial Piety, published in the 1740s. As the name implies, the text, which is intended to be a combination of entertainment, historical education, and moral edification for its readers, tells the story of 24 exemplary women who are known for their devotion to the virtue of ko, or xiao in Chinese, filial piety, particularly respect for elders in the family. The stories are pretty much universally examples of women who suffered indignities on behalf of men. For example, it holds up the tale of Tokiwa Gozen, wife of Minamoto no Yoshitomo, 
and mother of the great warrior Yoshitsune. The text claims that she essentially seduced the man who killed her husband, Taira no Kiyomori, to get him to spare Yoshitomo's sons, including both Yoshitsune and his half-brother, the future first Minamoto shogun Yoritomo. Thus, according to the text, quote, in order to help her three sons, Tokiwa Gozen expressed mercy and filiality together. On the surface, she sacrificed her chastity, but in her heart, she did not sacrifice her honor. Popular culture didn't offer women much in the way of reprieves, either. Kabuki plays, written universally by men, usually depicted women as either accessories to men whose main job was to be loyal to them, or as torn between the demands of their family and their own desires, often to the point of suicide. As an example of the former, the fictionalized play based on the 47 Ronin incident, known as the Kanade Honshu Shingura, and we'll talk more about the incident in a future episode, includes the character of Lady Enya, wife of the lord whose death and the subsequent need to avenge it sets the plot in motion. But Lady Enya's job in the narrative is basically just to incite the action. In the fictionalized version, her husband dies because she refuses another man's advances, and said man kills her husband as revenge against her. After that point, she drops out of the narrative completely, with the task of vengeance falling not to her, but to her dead husband's retainers. As an example of the latter, meanwhile, is the famous Love Suicides at Amijima, written by the nation's most famous playwright, Chikamatsu Monzaemon. The plot is, well, basically what the title makes it sound like. The female lead, Koharu, is a courtesan who is in love with a merchant, Jihei who can't marry her because he has to be with someone picked out by his family. Since there's some actual tension in her character, she has, well, more of a character, but still one entirely defined by the demands of social propriety and by the men in her life. Of course, popular media about women is not our only source of knowledge of the lives of women, and a lot of good research is being done into the lives of women during this period and the ways in which they were able to assert some agency over their destinies, despite official rhetoric pushing them only to serve the needs of their families. We've covered a bit of this research in the past, and there's no way I could meaningfully do it justice in just one section of one episode, so I am going to direct you to episode 356, which deals with material from Marsha Yonemoto's The Problem of Women in Early Modern Japan, and in particular, with two biographies of women from the period. First was the writer Inoue Tsujo from the Samurai class, who was able to become a career woman of sorts as part of the Edo-based household of her daimyo's family, and in particular as a companion to his wife. The second was Ito Maki, a commoner and daughter of a prominent physician, who doted on her and in particular arranged, rather unusually, for her to get a high-quality education. Most of our knowledge of her life comes from her letters home after she was able to marry into the family of one of the shogun's Hatamoto. A substantial status increase, but one that took her to Edo, far from her hometown in what's now Okayama Prefecture in western Honshu. There's also episode 456, based on Amy Stanley's incredible book Stranger in the Shogun City, which I would call not just a great work of Japanese history, but one of the best works of history I've read in general. Seriously, I can't recommend this book enough, and if you listen to this episode, you've heard me rave about it before. Broadly, the text is about trying to reconstruct the life of a woman named Tsunano, from Echigo Prefecture in what's now Niigata along the Japan Sea coast. Tsunano, born in 1804, was the daughter of a monk of the popular Nichiren sect, which did allow its monks to marry. After a series of failed marriages, she would run off to Edo to start her life anew and spend the rest of her life there. The book documents her journey, but also does a great job showing how her story intersects with other themes and moments in Japanese history. Seriously, it's really good. I was beyond impressed by it. I can't do it justice here. Go check the book out. As for children, well, that brings us to a fun subject. School. Education during the Edo period was not universal. That would have to wait to the end of feudalism when the newly installed national government passed a mandatory education law. But schooling was, by any and every metric, far more accessible during the age of Tokugawa rule than at any point prior in Japanese history. Members of the samurai class usually had access to a hankol, an academy run by their own feudal domain. 
These schools would teach literacy, of course, but also the skills expected of Confucian bureaucrats, which were what samurai had become during the Age of Peace. Knowledge of philosophy, history, more cultured arts like poetry and calligraphy. The Hanko also taught the skills of the warrior class, weapons, tactics, that sort of thing. The Hanko were only open to male students due to Neo-Confucian expectations that only men engaged in public service. Samurai women could also be educated, but by private tutors or members of their family if the family could afford it. The quality of a Hanko education could vary quite a bit, and in particular samurai from lower-ranking families often found their children got less attention from their instructors compared to the children of elite families. For example, Fukuzawa Yukichi, born to a lower-ranking samurai family of Nakatsu domain, would complain in his autobiography as an adult that despite being an adept pupil, he received very little attention or care from his instructors, who instead doted on the children of the rich and powerful. If lower-ranking samurai families could afford it, which very much not all of them could, but some had a decent income to pull from, they would often send their children to private academies which covered the same content, but without the social stratification of the samurai class more broadly. Some of these academies would even accept students who were not samurai, as long as their parents could pay. As for commoners, again there was some variation, depending primarily on personal wealth. The children of wealthy commoners could purchase a spot in a samurai-run private school, of course, and in some domains, they could donate enough to the domain treasury to purchase samurai status, and thus get their kids access to the domain hanko. This was a pretty good deal for both sides, with the commoners getting a degree of cachet and prestige, and the domain treasury getting a little something-something all its own. Of course, the practice was not without its detractors. The anonymous samurai author known as Buyo Inshi, whose Seji Kenbunroku, or Matters of the World, an account of what I've seen and heard, is essentially a list of complaints about the failures of Edo society, described his disgust at samurai status being traded like a mere commodity. Of course, pretty much everything Buyo Inshi ever wrote is just him complaining about how peace made people soft, so I guess take that with a grain of salt. For non-wealthy commoners, educational opportunities were a bit more limited. However, they did still exist. In particular, the country was home to a vast network of terakoya, or temple schools, attached to Buddhist religious institutions. The first terakoya had begun to emerge towards the end of the Age of Civil War, geared at teaching very basic literacy alongside a moral curriculum steeped in Buddhist tradition. For temples, this was obviously advantageous in terms of spreading the message of the faith, both in terms of the messaging students picked up in the classroom, and because that basic literacy allowed students to then engage with simplified religious tracts on their own. And of course, for students themselves, a chance to learn at schools that generally charged very low or no tuition was plenty advantageous in its own right. Of course, not every child had access to that opportunity. In particular, for poorer families, children were often needed for labor from a pretty young age, and thus couldn't be spared to run off even to a free terakoya for schooling. Estimating educational access or literacy rates is a pretty serious challenge during this period, but it's definitely clear access was far from universal, and that less than half of the overall population was literate by the end of the Edo period. So, that brings us to the end of our work or school day, What's left? Well, entertainment, of course, at least in the big cities. The Edo period is really the beginning of what you might call Japan's mass media era. Growing urbanization gave at least part of the population more regular access to entertainment, be it the theater, fine dining, or more adult pursuits. Theater, of course, is probably the first thing people think of when they think of popular entertainment during this time, particularly kabuki. Kabuki is a relatively new form of performing art in Japanese history, which originated in the early 1600s, when it grew out of the popular theatrical traditions of Kyoto, codified by one Izumo no Okuni, a female entertainer about whom very little is known for sure. What we do know is that Okuni's performances of early Kabuki were riotous and colorful, and I think riotous and colorful, to a degree of being pretty scandalous, is a great way to describe Kabuki in general. Kabuki is over the top, it is gratuitous, it is not no theater, which was very much elite entertainment where plots revolved around 
thoughtful contemplation of religious themes, that sort of stuff. Kabuki was sordid. It's dramatic. Think about the examples we've discussed. The bloody revenge of the 47 Ronins. The lurid tragedy of the love suicides at Amijima. That's pretty representative. And as a result, unlike No, Kabuki was extremely popular. It had a very large following, particularly in the cities among the Chonin class, who had the wealth and were not expected to maintain the standards of propriety that would have precluded them from the Kabuki box office. Indeed, in the beginning, Izumo no Okuni and her acting troupe were literally too popular. They were all women, and they were so scandalous in their public performances that the Tokugawa Bakufu would actually ban the form in 1629. It was only allowed to return to the stage with all male performers, whose flamboyant behavior in public was at least not as openly offensive to Neo-Confucian norms. Many feudal domains also banned their samurai from kabuki performances, for fear that the lurid dramas would prove undermining for their social fabric of the samurai class. Of course, all that did was make the plays very popular among members of the samurai class. In spite of, really because of, the controversy around it, Kabuki thrived. Kabuki districts in Osaka and Edo became major centers of popular culture and entertainment. Even those who couldn't afford tickets would devour images of the plays produced on woodblock prints, and had often heard of the most famous actors and roles. For example, Tsuneno, the woman whose recollections form the core of Stranger in the Shogun City, was an avid Kabuki fan despite never having the money to go to a show. One imagines that even if you couldn't afford tickets, the glitz and glamour of the whole scene was pretty intoxicating. Kabuki wasn't the only theatrical form of the period. I'm pretty fond of Bunraku, a form of puppet theater from this time, and there's also Rakugo, a type of early stand-up comedy or storytelling, you might call it. Restaurants and bars also flourished in the big city as cooks began moving to the castle towns, especially Edo, looking to serve the samurai population, and then figuring, hey, might as well take a buck from anyone who's got it. Other than the old classics of urban life, drinking and carousing and enjoying fine foods, probably the most distinctive field of Edo period urban entertainment was the so-called licensed districts essentially red-light districts. Most major cities had these. Edo's was the Oshiwara, Kyoto's was the Shimbara, and so on. Basically, this was a type of urban zoning, for lack of a better term, intended to restrict brothels to certain parts of the city to contain the public immorality that they supposedly fostered, and, of course, making them easier to police and tax. That public immorality, by the way, had little to do with sex, which was certainly not considered a polite subject, but was not as heavily stigmatized as it was, say, in contemporary Europe. Instead, the concern was twofold. First, brothels naturally tend to attract what we might call the seedier element, and you might want to keep that kind of person away from polite society. Second, were the women engaged in the world's oldest profession— the moral stigma against them existed, but it was different, once again, from what you see in Europe. Not so much to do with the act itself as the notion that prostitutes took wealth from others without producing something of actual social value, and were thus parasitic. Sometimes, according to the normative conventions of the period, this could be noble labor. One of the stock archetypes of story and stage was the young woman forced into prostitution to pay her family's debts. In other cases, it was not. For example, most sex workers were indentured. They had to work to pay off a debt for the brothel that employed them. Those who were not or who had paid off that indenture but continued to work in the field were heavily stigmatized for the reasons of parasitism we just discussed. It's also worth noting that while the various licensed quarters were home to plenty of carousing and generally behavior inappropriate for a family-friendly history podcast, such acts were, shockingly enough, not effectively confined to the licensed quarters. Our old stick-in-the-mud Buyo Inshi, for example, complained in his writings that prostitution had slipped the bounds of the licensed quarters. Female music tutors, or sewing instructors, could be hired to come to your home to tutor your family in valuable skills. And hey, if you just happen to really get along with that instructor in a very intimate way, and then tip them generously as a show of friendship... Well, that was nobody's business but your own. I do want to be fair to Buyo Inshi here. This was actually a secondary complaint for him. 
he reserved most of his opprobrium for pimps who he said exploited women, indentured into the sex trade, and forced them into desperation to secure as much money as possible from their partners, which is pretty accurate and insightful for a guy who is best known mostly for complaining. Anyway, there's a lot more, of course, we could say here that I don't have time for. I will direct you to episode 234 for a history of prostitution in Japan and to 303 for a discussion of the related but distinct phenomenon of the geisha. Not everyone, of course, had access to this kind of nightlife, which was, of course, very much a phenomenon of the rich urban classes. But I still find it fun to talk about the beginning, in many ways, of the urban nightlife that still exists in the big city today. So this is a taste of daily life in Tokugawa, Japan, at the height of the Edo period. Next week we'll have another, more thematic discussion, this time of Japan's foreign relations during this period. For now, that's all for this week. Thank you very much for listening. This show is a part of the Facing Backward podcast network. You can find out more about this show and our other shows at facingbackward.com, and you can support the network at patreon.com slash facingbackward. Special thanks to those who have given at our shout-out tier, Ian Leonard, Stephen Elkins, Martin Oliveira, Clark Canning, Ian Kellett, Matt Haynes, Jackie Frostocker, Monkey Sack, Alayla McCulloch, Karen Murphy, Peter Wales, Robert Prine, William Arno, Jonas Brandis, Nicholas Kroll, Jerry Spinrad, Jared Stevens, Jeffrey Dwork, Stefan Hrushka, Joshua Kane, Robbie and Cat, Jacob Key, Aaron Finkbeiner, and Anonymous Anna's Hummingbird, Mark Sai, Gil, Leslie Ikuta, Trash Taste Enjoyer, John, Christopher, Harrison Reese, Inoue Enrio's Ghostbusters, Nihongo Kaizen.com, Shimao Toshio's History of Yaponesia podcast, Jennifer Pianzo, James, A House is a Perfectly Cromulent Mascot, The Fish I Catch Our Road Scholars Compared to Samuel Lido, Schmuck, and Everything Changed When the Fire Nation Attacked. Thank you also to new donors to the History of Japan Patreon, Tom and Nate, for donating to support the show. Thanks again for listening, and I'll see you next week for the Foreign Relations of Tokugawa Japan.